All right, hello everybody. In the interest of time, we'll kick off and get going. My name is Ginny Barber. I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia. Welcome to our fifth webinar of 2022. Um, just the usual practicalities. So if you could just keep your, uh, your, your audio off and your camera off during the presentation. Uh, we will record the webinar and be posted on the website with slides afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and we'll read out and respond to them at the end. Uh, Joanna and Lena will uh, be uh, answering questions and we'll finish on or just before the hour. Um, so before we uh, formally begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. Um, I'm based in Mianjin, Brisbane, on the land of the Turbal and Yagara people. Um, and these have always been places of teaching, learning, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge the really important work that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play um, in our research communities. You're very welcome to acknowledge the lands that you're on in the chat. So for those of you that don't know Open Access Australasia, I will just tell you a little bit about um, our organisation. So we are uh, an organisation, a member organisation of 22 sorry, 29, 29 universities as of yesterday. We had one new member join yesterday um, across New Ze um, Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, our chair of the executive committee is Kim Terry from AUT, and we have a very diverse executive committee from across Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm the director and Sandra and Janet Cattrall are our project officers and as well as universities we also have um, six affiliate organisations which include Creative Commons Australia, Toa Toa Aotearoa New Zealand, the Australian Library and Information Association, the Australian Digital Alliance, Wikimedia Australia and the Australian Citizen Science Association so we're very much interested in the diversity of open access and um, uh, the approach for equity across this space. So I'm really delighted today to welcome um, our two speakers, uh, Joanna Ball and Lena Shah, who are going to talk to us about supporting equity, equity and diversity within scholarly communications and the role of the DOAJ, which is a, a topic that is very close to the heart of Open Access Australasia. It's one of the principles that we support specifically around equity and diversity. So Joanna um, is getting up at some horrible hour of the morning in the, in the UK. We're very grateful to her. Uh, not in, the, in Europe, I apologise. Um, she joined the OIJ as Managing Director in January this year and responsible for the strategic development of the organisation and ensuring a sustainable future for it. She has a long history of management and leadership roles both in the UK and in Denmark. Most recently is the head of the Roskilde University Library, which is part of the Royal Danish Library. And she has been chair of a number of another initiatives. Uh, Lena Shah is in a more favourable time zone for us, but again, we're also really grateful. Lena is based in Singapore and she's a managing editor of DOAJ since 2016 and oversees oh, the yeah, management. We certainly had quite a lot of feedback, as, as you know, oh. hundreds of responses, questions Sorry. and so forth. Um, manages a team of local volunteer editors and assessment of journals from Indonesia, India and other regions for inclusion in the DOAJ. Um, in alignment, and she's an active member of the DOHJ team that examines and evaluates publishers for questionable publishing practices, an incredibly important part of the work that DOA does. And Lena represents DOAJ on a number of collaboration organisations. So thank you very much and welcome to you both. Um, we're really delighted to have you here. I'll pass over to you to uh, share your slides. Thank you so much for that for that lovely welcome, um, Ginny. I hope you can all see my slides now. Can you see them? It's just black at the moment, Joanna. It's thinking about it. Um, let's try one more time if it's not. This is the moment for, for you all to think about uh, what questions you're going to ask whilst we sort out the technology. Uh, yeah. One more time. Uh, it did work a few minutes ago. Are we there now? Not, not quite yet, no, still black. Strange. OK, 
Okay. Uh, I think you shared your desktop last time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tried doing that a couple of times. It just doesn't seem to be. Is that still not working? No, it's not. Would you like me to share my, I've got the PDF F up. Would you like me to share that? Or Lena, I don't, do you have the slides? Uh, yeah, uh, I can try it. Yep. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's that's typical, isn't it? It works five minutes before you go uh, live and then perfect. Okay. Does that look good on the screen? Just yeah. into full screen mode? It's not on slideshow mode at the moment. But... Just give me a minute. Yeah. Is that okay? perfect? Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that warm, um, uh, warm welcome, Ginny. We are really pleased to be here with you today to talk about something which is also uh, really close to, to our hearts, which is around um, yeah, equity, diversity within scholarly communications. So I think Lena and I will be talking to you over the next um, half an hour or so about this. And there'll be time for questions afterwards. You want to move the next slides, Nina? Brilliant. So this is what we'll be covering um, today. We'll give you a brief um, introduction to the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, and then we will talk a little bit about what we mean by um, equity and diversity in context of, of, of today's session. Um, I'll cover a little bit around what uh, DOAJ is doing to support um, uh, diamond open access journals, um, as well as how we are uh, working to demonstrate equity and di in diversity within our kind of daily routine work. Lena will also talk about some new initiatives to support um, bibliodiversity within um, the index. And then we also look at um, some future challenges for us. And I'm sure you'll have lots of other future challenges for us that we can discuss um, afterwards as well. So first of all, um, an introduction to the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, I hope it's something that you're all uh, familiar with anyway, but if not, this is a little bit of information about us. Um, we, or the service at least, is a, is a unique and extensive index of peer-reviewed open access journals. Um, but the organization itself and, and, and DOAJ is actually much more than that. And we have a mission to um, raise a profile, raise the visibility of all uh, quality open access journals, um, regardless of where in the world they come from or which language they're in or which discipline they're in. Um, all new applications for journals to be indexed within DOAJ go through a really thorough uh, manual reviewing process by uh, a member or by volunteers and then with by a member of the DOAJ core team. And this means, this kind of really uh, thorough process means that our standards have become an unofficial gold standard for open access journal publishing, um, which are tr now trusted across the scholarly community. And another really important thing to note is that uh, all our services and our metadata are provided completely free of charge. Um, it's very important of us, for us to kind of retain our independence. Um, and so we are funded primarily by libraries, um, but also other uh, research funders, um, publishers, intermediaries as well. So here's a quick peek at our, our homepage as it, as it currently stands. Um, and what's nice about showing people this is it gives a kind of running total of where we are in terms of the numbers of journals within DOAJ. And we are, I think we're up to 18,200 now. And that, this was from, from last week, and that, that number is growing all the time. And we're taking in about 2,000 new journals um, every year. Um, you can also see the diversity there, 80 languages and 130 countries represented within um, the index. 
Um, and it's always good to point out that 12 and a half thousand of our journals don't charge um, an APC. So what do we mean by diversity, particularly in the context of our presentation uh, today? Well, what we're going to focus on is um, biblio diversity in particular. Thank you, Nina, that's great. That, Nina, that's great. Um, so, um, and, and diversity within the scholarly communications ecosystem. We won't be focusing so much on um, DOAJ as an inclusive organization itself or other aspects of um, equity and diversity, but very much on bibliodiversity within scholarly comms. Um, and like any ecosystem, uh, diversity uh, is important here, and there needs to be space for different types of languages, um, publication outputs, and also business models. So what isn't healthy for a, for a diverse uh, ecosystem is uh, a very small number of large publishers dominating the system and a really um, kind of intense focus on profitability because that stifles innovation and it stifles um, uh, new ideas. And focusing down to, to local journals as well, because I think it's worth mentioning them. It's not all about the, the big international players, as I said. Um, so why are journal, local journals important? Um, well, they are embedded in, in local culture and context. And so they're playing a really important and a different role within society. And particularly in subject areas like law, which is really focused on the kind of the local uh, legislative, uh, legislative system in each, each country. Um, they provide a really important connection between um, academia and practitioners. Um, they also promote the visibility of unique local research, which you perhaps wouldn't see and it wouldn't be of interest to an international journal. And they pu publish applied science, which is more relevant to the industries within that country. So, so they're a really important part of um, the scholarly communications ecosystem. Um, and for DOAJ, bibliodiversity is really important for us um, because our mission is around supporting all high quality open access journals. Um, and uh, since Plan S was introduced, um, of course, mainly in, in Europe and in, in North America, it has been criticized for privileging the larger commercial publishers. There's been a big emphasis on um, read and publish transformative deals. Um, which is, of course, leaving little space, um, certainly within, within the library budgets and within people's uh, uh, scope for, for smaller publishers and, and new models. And of course, we all know about the, the pressure for researchers to publish in uh, prestigious international journals um, and what that means for our ecosystem. So that also leaves smaller local journals more vulnerable. And just to, get, to go back to what I said earlier, 70% of our journals do not charge an APC. So we see it as our responsibility to increase visibility of, of those journals just as much as the ones from the big publishers that we have within our index. Um, multilingualism is also um, important and a really important aspect of this uh, drive to support uh, local journals. Um, and it's explicit in, in our mission then uh, there around, around languages. Um, I already mentioned that we, we list journals in 80 languages um, and we are signing up to uh, joining uh, other initiatives which also support uh, multilingualism within um, research, as well as making a lot of our key documents in terms of, our, uh, for example, our guide to applying um, available within, um, within different languages. Um, one of the initiatives is the Helsinki initiative, which you may have heard of. Um, this uh, started a few years ago, and it's an initiative around supporting multi, um, multilingualism within uh, research journals. Um, and it is focused on the fact that, that multilingual research is relevant, it's important in supporting uh, research at a local level, and it also can, can create impact.
And then as an organization, um, I know our focus isn't on this, but we, but we are um, a, a community organization, the OAJ, and we want to ensure that our advisory board and our council contain diverse voices so that we make sure that the organization is developing in a, a way that meets the needs of the whole community, not just a small subset of the people that, that use us. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, our, our core team here are, uh, at DOAJ are based in uh, 15 countries altogether. Um, and this is kind of further enhanced by our volunteers who are based across the world and our ambassador programme. And I know that Lena will be talking about that about that later. Um, and one other thing to note is that we have adopted the, the C4 DISC joint statement of principles um, around diversity and inclusion. So we are, we are also committed to that. Um, a little bit about how we are working to support uh, diamond open access journals, because that's um, something which is uh, currently very important to us. And there's, a, there's certainly a, a, a big focus on that um, here within, within Europe. And you may have seen this um, open access diamond journal study that was published, um, I think it was 18 months ago now, where DOAJ was um, a co-author um, and which really took a look at diamond um, open access publishing across the world um, and found that actually institutional publishing represents 44% of articles published in fully open access journals. And when I'm talking about the diamond journals, I mean those ones who are not uh, charging an, an APC to publish. That's a very important part of um, the open access landscape. This study also found that um, institutional publishing is really important for scholarly communication, supporting all those things that, that I was talking about earlier. But I also identified a need to uh, develop support and infrastructure for diamond open access journals. So I identified a number of kind of vulnerable areas for, for diamond journals around sustainability, around capacity, um, and around technical support, for example. Um, kind of taking a, a bit of a deep dive into um, uh, diamond journals in Australia, and I'm sure that you all have a much better feel for the kind of the, the local context in terms of Australia and, and New Zealand. But there are some research articles out there, which I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, and you can see that the, the, the diamond um, scene is, is flourishing as well in, um, in Australia. So 40% of active Australian journals are um, freely available. That doesn't necessarily mean they're open access, but they're, they're freely available um, within, uh, within the country. And only at the moment, 30, well, under 32% of those are freely ava are, are available within DOAJ. Um, and another study uh, showed that open access models um, are, are vulnerable they lack uh, sustainable business models and funding, and they don't have long, uh, they don't have plans for long-term preservation of their content. So there is a need to support, uh, to provide additional support for, for this type of journal. Um, following on from the report that was published last year around diamond open access journals, um, this year, uh, Science Europe Coalition S, OCRAS, and the French National Research Agency published this action plan for diamond open access, which is around addressing those needs that were identified as part of the, the diamond open access report. And although obviously this is an, uh, can be very much a European in initiative, I know that those behind the action plan are keen for it to have a much wider impact across the, the world and to involve um, other partners. Um, so the, the action plan um, itself focuses on efficiency, quality standards, capacity building and sustainability. But it's really this kind of international community that's growing up around the action plan, which is so important, which is bringing that diamond community together. And I know that um, Open Access um, Australasia has signed up 
um, for that. So that's really, really positive that you've also endorsed the, the action plan. The other thing falling out of the, the action plan is a Horizon Europe um, project um, around developing um, institutional open access publishing and providing support um, and standards. And that is a kind of major EU project which is about to launch um, next week, actually, um, and includes a number of partners from ac across Europe. So I'll, pa I'll pass over to, to Lena now, who's going to talk um, around um, how, how we support equity and diversity within DOAJ. Thank you, Joanna. So uh, let's look at uh, how, how diverse is uh, DOAJ in terms of uh, geography. Um, so uh, like Joanna just mentioned, the index is dynamic. And as of now, we list about 130 countries journals from 130 countries. Now, if we classify this, these countries into the global north and global south, then uh, we can see from this word art that we are almost equally diverse. But however, the number of total number of journals from the global south is uh, much smaller than the total number from the global north, which has 10,700 plus journals. Uh, also, uh, there are only a handful of uh, countries uh, that have more than 500 journals, like for example, Spain, UK, and US in the global north, and Indonesia, Iran, and Brazil in the global south. This is in contrast to the number of countries that you see in uh, highlighted in red, which have less than about 100 journals. And these are the areas that we would like to focus on to bring them on board. Uh, for open access. Now, DOJ supports equity in open access publishing in a number of ways. Um, persistent article identifiers are not mandatory uh, for inclusion in DOJ. This helps, this is very useful for uh, small publishers, publishers with limited funding, and it supports their uh, discoverability of of their journals uh, uh, within by by getting listed in DOAG. From uh, last year, uh, we have also formalized our criteria for new journals who may apply to us if they have a publishing history for more than one year, or they have published ten articles at least. Uh, we we uh, journals apply to us across all disciplines. We are very cognizant of the fact that we are not the experts in all areas and. We have appointed a voluntary editorial subcommittee for advice on uh, editorial issues that may arise from our day-to-day -day operations, quality of the article itself, or other legal and copyright issues. The committee members are um, from diverse disciplines such as medicine, publishing, and social sciences. Apart from this, uh, we also engage uh, volunteer editors now, every journal that applies to us uh, is manually reviewed by us through a multi-tier review system of which our volunteers are an integral part. Uh, by having our volunteers uh, 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 as a part of our review system, we ensure that uh, our review is inclusive of uh, local publishing practices and local uh, context. And uh, we use this information from our volunteers before we make a, rec a recommendation to accept journals or to reject them. We also uh, welcome non-English language journals, which are often excluded from Web of Science and Scopus. DOJ provides discoverability for these non-English journals. Um, in early this year, we revamped our whole uh, uh, DOJ website. And what we did is to re revise and publish our DOJ criteria in an informal and simple, simple language. This was to support publishers who do not have English as a first language. Uh, we are a small team, as Joanna just mentioned, and uh, we, we, we cannot reach out to all the local publishers everywhere in the world. And that is why we engage with our uh, vol volunteer ambassadors around the world who help us to promote open access, support local publishers, promote DOAG. And they do this by holding events in the local regions or holding workshops for local journal publishers. In 2021, we, uh, our ambassadors have held 95 such public engagements. 
Now, DOJ metadata is free to download and reuse. It is also integrated with uh, library discovery systems, giving uh, users access to a diverse range. Uh, we are also included in the Planus journal checker tool and Sherpa Romeo. Mm, unlike uh, most indexing services, uh, we do not collect article metadata, but we rely on publishers to uh, provide them to us. And we are always working towards making this process uh, easier for them. Uh, so very recently this month, uh, in addition to two formats, they are also able to upload their article metadata using Crossref uh, XML. So uh, DOJ has been busy with some new initiatives in the last couple of years to improve uh, bibliodiversity. Uh, one of these projects was uh, started with an open letter published in 2019 and DOJ called on representative representative groups in social sciences and humanities to identify journals that should be indexed in DOAG. In response to this letter, uh, we had a collaboration with TSV, the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. The aim was to help Finnish journals uh, apply to us, and uh, the project was carried out from 2019 May to the end of December 2020. And at the end of this project, uh, we started with 29 finished journals and we ended with 63 journals as of now. And there are more that continue to apply. We are also running similar programs in France and Denmark as well. We also have an initiative that we started in early uh, 2021 with China. The aim was to increase uh, Chinese journals that are indexed in DOA, uh, to increase the Chinese journals, Chinese language journals, and to raise the awareness of DOAJ in China. Uh, we initiated a pre-evaluation pre program which targeted these uh, group of journals. And so far, we, we have 33% of the journals from this program that have been accepted into DOAJ. We have also delivered webinars and we have been invited by the Tsinghua University Press and China Periodical Associations to do two more in September or early uh, next month. We have a, a number of initiatives in Africa. We have worked with the African Continental Open Access Platform. They have a small number of journals, but uh, DOG staff has provided training for these journals to be compliant with the DOJ criteria. This was done in the middle of uh, June, uh, I mean, in the middle of last year, in June 2021. We, uh, DOJ staff has also participated in the African webinar series. Uh, this was again, a joint initiative by uh, multiple organizations and our presentations were given in English as well as French. These webinars were on topics such as uh, open access, copyright, licensing, and other relevant uh, areas for journal publishers. And as a result of this webinar, ASAP, that is the African Science Academy, uh, they have expressed an interest to, to be indexed in DOAG. Uh, with a collaboration with uh, the Academy of, again, with the Academy of Science South Africa and the South African Department of Higher Education, DOJ has been included in the list of accredited journals for South Africa in February 2021. For future plans, uh, we would like to collaborate with the African Journals Online. What we would like to do is to identify journals with star ratings, work with them to establish contact with journals, and to encourage them to to be DOAJ compliant and apply to be listed in DOAJ. JASPER is an acronym, uh, stands for Journals Are Preserved Forever. This was a, a initiative that uh, began with a study that showed that open access journals with limited financial resources are, are at a high risk of disappearing. Uh, this was a joint initiative uh, launched by DOAJ uh, with CLOCKSS, Internet Archive, uh, PKP, and the Keepers Registry in November 2020. And the, the journals that were targeted at, were DOAJ listed and which did not have any APCs. The aim was to raise awareness and offer affordable archiving options to these journals that were at a risk of disappearing. 
the pilot phase, uh, the first phase was very successful. It was self-funded. And as of today, a handful of these journals are now successfully preserved in clock SS. And now we are currently in phase two to look at how this can progress further. Some of the challenges that we have faced while we did these projects was that this requires resources. We need dedicated staff on our side to drive these projects and to bring structure to have deadlines and have regular follow-ups. It requires long-term planning because sometimes progress is slow. Journals take time to make require the changes on their side. And we need initiative from the local partners who would like to be indexed in DOAG. So these were some of the challenges that we faced. And I will hand it back to Joanna to talk about some of the future challenges. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, so we just want to finish off with a few of the future challenges. Of course, the list is probably five times longer than this, um, but we've just pulled out three, perhaps quite concrete um, challenges that we would like to work on over the, the, the next few years. Um, and we've touched on uh, DOAJ as an organization and our own diversity. Um, and of course, that's always something that we, we, we can do more on. Um, and you may well have heard of a framework called the, the, the Forest Framework, which is something that's come out of the Next Generation Libraries project. Um, and this framework is for organizations to um, kind of demonstrate or, or demonstrate, evaluate, and hopefully in, in improve their alignment with key values. And this includes things like um, representative governance, um, equity, um, accessibility, and anti-oppression. So actually working through that framework will, I hope, help us identify specific actions that we can take uh, to improve our own um, diversity. The second thing I just wanted to highlight was the DOAJ seal, which is um, something which is almost kind of a gold star on top of the DOAJ uh, uh, um, inclusion. So which is, which is more difficult for journals to achieve and it includes things like having CC BY license and having um, uh, kind of proper digital preservation set up for your journal. And of course, this is more difficult for um, uh, smaller publishers to address. Um, so it, we are um, interested to see whether that creates kind of a false divide within our um, with our within our index, and, and to look at what we can we can do to uh, to address that. And then finally, one for the the librarians here today. We have we we currently have uh, use Library of Congress subject classification. Um, for our index, which, as you know, is not very um, diverse, it's not very up to date, um, not very inclusive. Um, so over the next year, we'll be working with um, actually a library school in, in Ottawa for, to do some work on identifying a more suitable um, a, a taxonomy for us as a, as a diverse and inclusive index, um, and then working with a, with a project in Germany to um, actually implement that taxonomy. So those are three of the, uh, the things that we'll be focusing on in future. Um, and so that's all that Lena and I wanted to present to you today, but we're really looking forward to having a discussion with you around um, some of the issues that, that we raised or actually around your, we'd love to hear more about the, kind of the local context and challenges around uh, uh, smaller uh, publishers uh, within your region. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Joanna and Lena. That was that was really interesting, and it's great to see all the initiatives that's happen, happening at DOAJ. And, you know, with a, a relatively small organisation that's doing really important work. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we've got some questions coming in on the chat. So I will um, read them out, but please keep them coming. Um, so the first one is from Dimity Flanagan. So she's asked um, through the finished project and others, did you get a sense of what were the key barriers for journals qualifying for DOA inclusion and what areas did they need extra support in or was it more an issue of raising awareness about the value of DOAJ? Um, yeah, I think Lena, Lena touched on this a little bit, but you certainly um, raising awareness was really important. 
uh, particularly amongst can edit, you know, local editors and editorial boards who perhaps just didn't see the, the value of being indexed in DOH and perhaps didn't know who we were um, and what we were about. So that's one um, stumbling block. I think the other one we really encountered was that things just things just take a long time when you're working with local journals because they're so under-resourced. Um, and, it, and, and communication takes a long time. Um, often editors will need to consult with their editorial board before they can make a decision. So all of that um, makes, things, makes things slow. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Lena. Yeah, the only thing I want to add is uh, the, it's also the language. Uh, many a times uh, we need to translate our documents or our criteria, or we need a staff member who is able to converse in the local language. So that's another challenge. Just, just to follow on from that, do you think that the challenges with um, who you communicate with depends on who the, whether you have editors who are academics or library staff? Is that do you have a sort of sense of where the biggest, I guess, penetration of DOHs do it DOHs is amongst sort of um, individual individuals? Um, I think librarians. Well, I hope, but I, I think librarians generally. Uh, know who we are know why we're important and why it's important for journals to be there so i think that and it is more the kind of the, the academics who perhaps aren't familiar with us as a as a service um i would say yeah yeah um okay so next question is from jackie wilson stone says she says of the 2000 journals being added uh what what proportion are new versus older journals so i guess uh, new journals versus you know ones that have been established for a while do you have any sense of that? Yeah, we do, I don't think we collect statistics on that. That's a great question. Lena, do you have a feel for that? Uh, we don't have statistics, but uh, based on the number of uh, applications we go through, uh, we have a diverse range of uh, publishers. Of course, we have the broader commercial publishers, and then we have institutional publishers, we have society and associations, and then the smaller publishers and the private ones. So. Uh, it's quite diverse and uh, I would say it's a 40 40 percent of them are non-commercial or uh, somewhere there I mean we don't have the exact stats in terms okay. of the the sorry the question around um the, was it the, the the newer older yes yes new newer uh, versus established journals I guess yeah, born I, away versus converting hmm. ones yeah would you have a feel for that, Lena? Lena's the person who kind of sees these things come <laughs> through more regularly, but it's quite hard. Uh, yeah, the new journals would be a much smaller percentage, I think, maybe 10, 15 percent of the overall journals that we get in a year. Yeah. Yeah, that is, it is a very interesting question because it shows you the sort of evolution of what's happening, mm, doesn't it, yeah, of, yeah. within within publishing. Um, OK, so another, another question about um, do you have any initiatives around linking researchers looking to publish with local journals that might suit them? Um, um, I would say no, we no, we don't. Um, but we know that that's how the database or the index is used a lot. Um, I guess that the, the, the initiative we are working on, which will it help to improve that, is around our subject classification, um, because quite often a researcher will just type in a word, you know, a, a precise uh, a piece of information around their research and then nothing will come up. So it's around about making sure that our subject classification is fit for purpose. Yeah, um, and, and also I guess, sorry, and I also guess related very much to the origin of the journal as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it's very easy for people to see where the journals uh, are published, at least within the index and to, to limit according to that. So that's yeah. certainly possible now. Um, and so related to that is a question um, that a question we get from researchers is the ability to filter or sort by APC costs. So you obviously have no APC versus APC. Are you actually able to filter more directly than that? Or is that something that you've been asked to look at? Mm. You can you can see the cost, can't you, for each for the um, journals on, of yes. if it has an APC? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we don't have further than that. I mean, we can't uh, filter down, you know, like within a range of APCs. <laughs> no, we can't do that yet. Not yet. 
Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Um, so I was going to ask you a question about the Jasper initiative, which, which I think looks like an incredibly important one. Um, so you said you're in the second phase of that. Um, is there a, what's the process for journals wanting to apply to that? And do you have a sort of wait list of journals that are coming to you for that? It seems to me a very important um, yeah. thing to be tackling. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, go for it. That's fine. Yeah, so the first phase was uh, largely initiated by DOAJ itself. Uh, we used uh, journals that were listed in DOAJ and did not charge any APCs. And uh, for th this was largely self-funded. But for the second phase, from what I know, is uh, we are looking at broadening the selection criteria for journals. And we are also looking for funding, is uh, what I know. Maybe Joanna knows a uh, little more about it. Um, well, if we are still, we are still in, in in early phases, kind of um, trying to work out how to kind of have a more sustainable model for this. So I think at the moment um, there aren't ways for 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 journals to kind of volunteer to be kind of in the, in the next tranche or anything. But obviously um, that will be um, that will be something that we'll be looking at. Yeah, and we're also looking at uh, just it just came to my mind that we're also looking at ways of how we can increase the number of uh, options for preservation that we can offer them. Yeah, in the second phase. Mm. Great. So one maybe what a light touch one or a more, and a more comprehensive one, or is that is that what you're thinking with the next phase? Sorry, what was your question? I, I was wondering, so you think of different options, so one, one maybe a, one more comprehensive type of um, archiving and one that's sort of simpler to do. I, I'm, I'm curious about how much work there is for the journals to do to be part of the JASPER initiative. Yeah, I think that one of the most uh, challenging thing is to bring awareness of uh, these uh, options that they have and to communicate it with them and to get them on board. I think that is the biggest challenge we have. Yeah. Because many of them are small journals and yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes it can be quite challenging. Yeah. And, and there is, we are looking at different options. So the kind of perhaps more, the more comprehensive uh, clocks version, but also internet archive. So we're still very much in the kind of exploratory phase of, of this work. Great. Uh, okay, so another question is about um, how does your information get updated over time, e.g. E if an APC cost changes, who's responsible for ensuring that's kept up to date? Do you like to talk about updating? Okay, <laughs> okay so we, we have an option for publishers to submit an update request to us. So that is one way uh, how publishers can update their information in our records. The other, uh, uh, the, the other thing that uh, we do proactively is to uh, check all the information we have. We have used our resources that uh, we currently have, which is our staff, and we have checked all the links and or we review all the information and the records that we have ourselves. And we have done this periodically, but we are also looking at how we can use software to do this rather than uh, manually updating our records and reviewing and checking them. But we, we are very cognizant of this, that uh, the metadata needs to be updated and we are working on solving this, yeah. Anything else, Joanna? No, I was gonna say that, that that is an increasing focus for us really, because we know that um, lots of people are relying on our data from researchers, uh, you know, funders, publishers. Um, and so it is really important that we are able to not just add new journals, but to be able to go through and kind of quality assure the records that we do have w within the index. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the eternal challenge, isn't it, of keeping these initiatives up yeah. to date? <laughs> Um, okay, so another question from Janet Catterall is about, so Janet is one of our project new, our newest project officer. Um, major publishers are trying hard to identify themselves with open publishing and archiving. I guess this concept of open washing we've heard about. Um, what are your thoughts about this and how do we explain that change? And I guess also how do we guard against publishers that perhaps might be trying to um, I said, get on your coattails, I think, and perhaps be there for reasons to perhaps not, not as... Um, not as good as we'd like them to be. Gosh, that's a really uh, 
That's a really difficult question. Um, I would, I I would say first of all that we are we are essentially business model agnostic, um, and so we, you know, we 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 don't have a kind of preferred a preferred business model. Um, we we try and kind of not get involved in in that debate. But obviously, where our focus is is on the more vulnerable journals. So that's why we're kind of increasing our focus, uh, our focus on them. Um, of course, yeah, we're aware of what's going on um, in the industry. Um, I, yeah, I would, and I, you know, the, the the movement towards you know these huge read and publish deals is is dangerous. It's dangerous for for the 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 ecosystem, and it just um, promotes you know, dominance of a, a very few players within um, the industry. So, I mean, in my previous role, when I was a librarian, I suppose it was, it was more just about talking to researchers around the, what the different options are and what the different business models mean. And of course, that it's not always, it doesn't have to, you don't have to publish in um, the major journals to be able to make impact. Actually, it's more important to, to publish openly. So um, yeah, but that's a really that's a really difficult one. Yeah, it's it's it is a challenge I think we're all facing. But I think that's you know for for people who are advocating for open access, having a just having a, a sort of directory like DOAJ there to be able to you know support and showcase the the, the smaller journals is just is incredibly important and a real pushback against the um that type of publisher dominance. Um, mm. Okay. A couple of ones. One jumping back to the um, uh, to the concept of keeping things up to date. So, do you do you keep a, a historical snapshot of your database? I guess that would be pretty interesting, given that you did a huge um, reassessment of it a few years ago. Yes, I mean we 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 must do. Um, I don't know how easy it would be. I don't think that's publicly available. Um, the data is always um, available to um, kind of data dump is all, all available, always available to, to get hold of. Um, but I mean that's something I would need to, to check. But please do um, you know get in touch with us about that if that's something you're interested in. We do you know we do track changes over time. So yeah. So perhaps following on from that, do you have journals that? I mean, how often do journals come in and come out of um, of the of the directory, or is that? What, what's the sort of movement of individual journals, I guess? Yeah, I mean, that's also something we do track journals that have been, been removed, but I don't know, Elena, whether you would... Mm -hmm. like so, uh, yeah, uh, just as I mentioned in the previous question about uh, how do you keep your uh, records updated? So when we check for these uh, links and if there is something unusual or if there's... Uh, the journal has just seized or anything like that, then they they are taken out of our index. And uh, if there is some other information we have received or something suspicious, then also they are taken out. Or if they do not satisfy our criteria, suddenly the website changes or they move to a new publisher and the whole website is uh, totally different and they do not satisfy our criteria anymore, then they they do get taken out. But they can always reapply to us and. We will be, they will be reviewed again. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, M put a question in here, but she says she felt it's been answered earlier, so I won't I won't ask that one. What about the um, uh, Richard and Richard commented about using your API for research purposes, so <laughs> you're you're pleased to know it's getting a, a, a great amount of usage from over here. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, can I just ask you to comment on um, about the? Uh, I was very struck by the the number of journals from Indonesia that you have from the global south and I know that overall they have a large number of journals just overall even you know not even just open access ones is that is that something that you have any issues about you are you seeing that expanding I know that there are Indonesian researchers who are trying very hard to kind of maintain the quality of those journals but I just wondered if you had any thoughts of that in particular because it's quite striking yeah it is it is striking and uh the reason for this is uh, because uh, all the journals that are coming in from Indonesia are institutional journals and they're all open access. And uh, the reason for such a high publication volume from Indonesia is because uh, the researchers have a KPI to publish their research in 
local journals or their own journals. And I think uh, these are largely published in Bahasa Indonesia. And the other reason is, uh, yeah, I think the main reason is their KPIs to publish. So that's the reason why we have such high volume. And these are gen generally very small specialist journals so that yeah. they, yeah. You know, it's interest. It's an interesting example of how you know something, a particular activity, is driving, yeah, you know, an outcome, yeah. which is the, sort of the proliferation proliferation of journals. Um, mm -hmm. So, we're almost getting to the end, I just wanted to ask you one more question, which you talk about um, wanting to collaborate and organisations to work with. Who who are your highest priorities to sort of collaborate with? So maybe for the next stage of the DOAJ. Gosh, that's a, yeah, another another big question. Um, I suppose it's a different the purposes, different purposes for different collaborations. So we you know we're we're collaborating more with um, other open initiatives um, and infrastructures in terms of highlighting the need for sustainability, the sustainability of those initiatives, um, and then in in terms of our ourselves as as an organisation, we we just started a new partnership with um, open air around um, our metadata. Um, and then of course, there's, there's the, um, the kind of acquisition projects or the, the, the projects to get more journals into the OAJ that, that Lena was talking about. Um, and we, I mean, we do, we do want to focus more on, on um, particularly for example, Africa um, in terms of getting more journals um, in from there. So we are always looking for, for kind of local organizations who will be able to work with us to do some of that work around coordinating um, and communicating with um, local journal editors um, for example um, and a little bit like in the the, the, the Finnish projects or the, the Danish project that, that Lena was talking about um, and so for you know for example within there are a number of journals uh, within um, Australasia that aren't in in the OAJ. So if there was a, a local organisation who wanted to co coordinate that work and work with us um, to to increase the number, that was something would be something we would be really pleased really pleased to see. Great, thank you. I think that's a bit of a call to action for us. So thank you very much. I feel like that. I mean, the work that you've done and um, all of the work, for example, just. Um, enhancing things like things like bibliodiversity and bringing that right to the absolute forefront of, of of the open access debate has just been incredibly important and you know the work that you know you did with coalition s on the diamond journals project all of that i think has really brought the, these journals right back into the mainstream of 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 you yeah, the future of publishing which is which is really tremendous to see so I think we'll draw it to an end there. Joanna and Lena, thank you so much for um, for all of your, your work. Thank you for coming to talk to us, yeah. Joanna in particular, at a horrible time of day and um, really um, giving us this sort of sense of, of the, what you're trying to do at, um, at DOIJ. And, you know, I think we have some really good support from over here. Um, there's lots of positive comments coming in and and thank yous and we'll keep in touch and I think um, absolutely your, your call to how we might try and um, promote and get together a group of uh, journals here to help feed into DOAJ is something that we can certainly take forward. So thank you very much and um, look forward to participating and collaborating more in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.